there are plenty of people out in the world applying to medical schools who have undergone treatment for potentially life-threatening issues, and now they're fine. Mm-hmm. And, and they're off to medical school. Ask Dr. Gray pre-med Q&A brought to you by Blueprint MCAD. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm wonderful. What can I help you with? So I submitted a question um, concerning basically health issues as far as applying to med school and how that could, um, I guess, affect my chances of getting in and whether or not, um, I guess, admissions committees would have concerns regarding applicant health. Okay. Um, I am currently a first semester sophomore, but over the course of my freshman year last year in college, I had four brain surgeries. Um, I, right before the school year started, I um, had, I believe, two instances of brain bleed because earlier in the summer I had a massive headache and um, just kind of ignored it for a while until it went away. It was pretty awful, but I just never did anything about it. Um, The second time it happened, about two days into it, I finally decided to go somewhere and do something. So um, I went to the ER and I told the um, ER doc there my symptoms. And immediately he was like, I think you have a brain bleed. And my mom was in there with me. And she was like, okay, cool. And the doctor (laughs) was like, okay, so we're going to do a scan just to make sure. And she was like, okay, it's just to make sure, right? Like you don't actually think that's it. And he was like, ah, maybe. (laughs) And so we did it. And what do you know? He was completely right. There was um, blood in my um, right lateral ventricle. Um, They found an AVM with an aneurysm on it. I had um, in August last year on my 18th birthday, I had um, an embolization for that. Luckily they got the aneurysm. So that was awesome. It's a good birthday Uh, present. It was. That was definitely nice. Take away the, you know, life-threatening aneurysm. Yeah. Unfortunately, not all of the AVM was embolized. Um, it did cause actually a stroke. And so I was in a induced coma for a few days. And once I woke up, I had to relearn to walk and talk. And I was just cognitively not all right for a while. Um, I couldn't tell a circle from a square. I remember at one point they gave me a paper of like circles and squares and they were like, okay, mark off all the squares. And I missed yep. like half of them and I had no clue. thought I was fine. <laughs> um, and so eventually I finally regained everything. Like I'm fine now. Thank goodness. I'm super lucky and I'm aware of that and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Um, but now um, I had two embolizations after that didn't work. So I had gamma knife surgery um, a couple months ago. Okay. And so now I'm just kind of waiting for that. My concern comes in where the gamma knife surgery takes three to four years to work. Um, I'm a sophomore right now. So when I'm applying, I'm not going to know whether or not it worked. So I will still actively have an AVM that of course has like, since it's bled a 4% chance of bleeding per year. And if med school's four years in my head, I'm just thinking like, okay, are they going to look at that and say, this applicant has a 16% chance of having a brain bleed <laughs> while she's here. Um, yeah. Don't want that. Yeah. And then pick someone else because of that. So I guess that's yeah. just kind of a very real concern I have. And I'm kind of, I'm very concerned about it. <laughs> yeah. So so here's the question. Besides this being between you and me and people watching on YouTube, right? we're not using names or anything. So, so that's okay. <laughs> How is the medical school going to know this? I guess for me, I would think I would write about it in my personal statement because it's a huge reason of why I want to do this and um, okay. why I met and why I want to go into this field. I absolutely like loved, love, loved the doctors I met and just like how they um, cared for me. And I loved seeing their passion for what they do. And so it just he- had a huge instrumental role in me choosing to do this. And so yeah. I feel like I would probably talk about it and I don't know how to tell my story without it. Yeah. And that's the perfect answer. Your, your answer is basically like, it's part of my journey. I need to talk about it, which which mm-hmm. is the answer. So in my mind, you should talk about it. You should talk about it as a, this happened to me and I was treated. They don't need to know the specifics. They can look it up if they want of like, oh, Gamma Knife takes X number of years to actually be effective and blah, 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 blah. Like, I don't know that as a physician. I I don't know those those numbers. And so the the likelihood of someone reading your application and going, uh-oh, like this person has a 4% chance of, of a rebleed every year while she's in medical school, they're not going to know that. They're going to know what you tell them. And what you tell them is you had this experience, you were treated, it was a, a blessing, and now you want to have this impact on other people. Right? End of story. 
there are plenty of people out in the world applying to medical schools who have undergone treatment for potentially life-threatening issues, and now they're fine. Mm-hmm. And, and they're off to medical school, right? They may have some lingering whatever. Uh, you may have some lingering cognitive issues, lingering whatever, right? But you're fine. Mm-hmm. You get good grades, you get a good MCAT score, you do all the clinical stuff, you're fine. Don't okay. leave doubt in their mind by saying, but there's also a uh, potential 4%, blah, 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 right? Yeah. Every normal person walking around has a potential to have a brain bleed. I literally, just myself, like a month ago, had a, a CTA of my brain uh, because my wife is worried that I have, have an aneurysm because I've been having headaches lately and my, my dad died of a, a sudden uh, brain bleed. So she's like, she's a neurologist. She's like, we're getting yeah. you a CTA of your head because I need to make sure you don't have an aneurysm and you're not, you're not going to drop dead on me tomorrow. Luckily, mm-hmm. knock on wood, I didn't have any aneurysm. So, yes. um, awesome. <laughs> but, but we all have that, right? I could walk across the street and die tomorrow uh, getting hit by a bus. So yeah. obviously, medical schools are trying to mitigate the risks of people not being able to pass medical school because of, of grade issues. Mm-hmm. Um, not being able to do whatever, uh, which is why we have applications in medical school and you have to prove that you want to do this. You have to prove that you you can do it. Um, and yes, there's always a theor- theoretical risk that someone's not going to make it through medical school because they have a brain bleed, because they get in a car accident, because they get a high bus, whatever, right? There, there are lots of reasons. So I wouldn't worry about that aspect for them. Don't, don't give them your worry. Okay. Yes, sir. That definitely helps a lot. I hadn't really thought about just not talking about that part of it. So, okay. I just kind of assumed that they maybe would know how long it takes for the game and have to work, but I know Man. it's not a common thing. So, yeah. okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then I do have a few more questions if yeah. we still have time. Let's go. Um, so I'm also a track and cross country athlete at my school. Um, and so I guess I know I've heard you say many times it's definitely best to take the MCAT in April, May, somewhere around there to get your scores back, rolling admissions, all of that. Um, I know that just with track season, it's full-time job at least. Like so many hours go into that, traveling, practice, everything. Um, So I just do not- Is it a spring sport? Mm -hmm. Track is spring, cross country is fall. So it's year round, (laughs) meets every weekend. Yeah. It's a lot. So I'm just kind of worried that I'm not going to be able to prepare effectively at all during the spring semester of when the year that I'm trying to take the MCAT. And so I'm from Texas. And so um, the schools that I want to go to would be UT Southwestern, Baylor. I know they're pretty competitive as far as like scores, stats, everything like that goes. And so I guess my question is, if I take it in june is that going to be too late for them like is that going to put me at a disadvantage for those schools yeah so it probably won't put you at a disadvantage uh in terms of getting your score back then the how i've been talking about this lately is it's not just getting a a score back later it's Mm -hmm. also the fact that your mcat prep is conflicting with getting good grades, being Mm -hmm. an athlete, and applying to medical school. The -hmm. medical school application takes a long time. Writing your personal Mm -hmm. statement, going through a dozen drafts, writing your activities, going through a dozen drafts, getting all of your letters of recommendations under control, building your school list, working on secondary essays. All of that stuff takes a lot of time. And on top of all the stress of studying for the MCAT, being an athlete, getting good grades while you're still in school, Mm -hmm. for a lot of people, it's just too much if you can't get the MCAT out of the way earlier. So one option is just wait a year to apply. Now you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. You're you're getting the MCAT pushed further away outside Mm -hmm. of your um, uh, competition uh, being an athlete and, and classes and stuff. And mm-hmm. you're another year healed with the gamma knife as well. And there's, there's less concern potentially in your head for what's mm-hmm. going on in your head um, with, with that. And, and obviously time will tell with, with how you are dealing with, um, with what's going on inside of your body and, and, and mentally mm-hmm. how, you, how you deal with that. When I was first 
diagnosed with demyelinating conditions in my spinal cord. We didn't know, is this MS? Is this not? Yeah. I had this like crisis of, of faith of like, I could wake up tomorrow and not be able to move my legs if this is MS. Yeah. And, and just with the, the chronic progression of it. Luckily, at this point, we don't think it's MS. And it was just kind of a one-time attack on my spinal cord. And, and I'm fine other than just random weird pains every now and then. Um, mm -hmm. but, but maybe pushing it out a year application-wise will help stress levels, anxiety levels around what's going on inside your body. It will help with your MCAT prep so you don't have to take it later um, during the application cycle. You can focus on applications while you're not being a student athlete and a student and everything else. So that's, mm -hmm. that's one potential option. The other potential option is you take it earlier. You, you take it as early as you can, like September of the mm -hmm. year before you were expecting so you get okay. it out of the way much earlier. And that just depends on how prepared you can be. Obviously, you're an athlete, so that takes up a lot of time. Um, how are your prereqs? Uh, are you going to get enough courses under your belt to be comfortable taking the MCAT that early? Um, mm -hmm. and, and just everything else along with prepping for the MCAT. Okay. That definitely helps. I had looked at taking it like the summer before, like all of September of the year prior. Um, and I just think that with prereqs and what I found um, or heard other students say were helpful on the MCAT, um, I just don't think that it would be b that beneficial just because of the classes that I need to take, um, especially with my health stuff and stuff getting pushed back a little bit already. Um, I went to school through all of it, but I didn't get wow. to take some of the classes that I wanted to. So, yeah. Um, Amazing. Yeah, the, um, the first the first surgery that caused the stroke, my neurosurgeon, who I love is, and is absolutely phenomenal, he um, definitely told me to drop out of school. And he was like, you're going to drop out anyway. Just do it now. Like, Oh, that's not cool. It. And I was like, actually. Have I'm some faith. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was cool. And actually, that kind of brings up another question. So my um, – I know like letters of rec are typically done by um, – people in academics, your professors, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I do know my surgeon very well. I've shouted him quite a bit and I'm going to be continuing to. And of course I've, over the past year, I've been in his care in the hospital for about a month. And so I've talked to yeah. him a lot there. Um, and I feel like I do know him well. I know he doesn't know me academically, but like, would that, would it be a bad idea? I know some people do ask people they've shadowed to write letters of rec. Um, how, like, what is your opinion on that? I think it would be an, a phenomenal letter of recommendation depending on how well he knows you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any conflict there that he's like, well, I, mm -hmm. I've treated you, therefore I can't write you a letter of recommendation. The, yeah. the typical conflict is like your family member or your close okay. family friend. That, that potentially is more of a conflict. Um, okay. But being your treating physician and, and then you have transformed that relationship into mm – -hmm kind of a mentor mentee shadow sh shadower shadowy whatever uh <laughs> yeah. relationship i think that's perfectly fine okay awesome i had asked someone else about that and the answer i got was kind of like no there's like if he treated you that's probably not the best idea and so that makes me feel better so thank you for that yeah but because um, he's not writing the letter as as like i treated this person and therefore they're going to be a good yeah. medical student it's okay. like i've gotten to know this person over the years and he doesn't have to put that he was your treating physician in the letter um okay. so it's 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 about who you are not the relationship mm -hmm. that you have okay okay that definitely clarifies that thank you okay yeah. and then one more question that is kind of off the wall random um i know a lot of people who have done um programs such as like the texas ones are like the family medicine accelerated track where you go and like you're kind of pre-matched into re residency i know there's a lot of family med ones i've seen a lot of orthopedic surgery ones for some reason um and then so i guess just with my relationship with my surgeon i've talked to him a lot about like even before all of my health stuff i had a huge interest in the brain and thought it was amazing and i definitely considered this career path before and then all of this happened and i made some connections and now talking to those surgeons i'm like they have definitely encouraged me and um i feel like i am fairly certain that i'm going to go down the road of um applying to try to match to neurosurgery okay. um in med school hopefully at least that's the plan i know i'm very early on yep. um, and i've set up shadowing for other specialties because i know that's definitely a good idea awesome. um but i just feel like the things that impact us i know that people are naturally drawn to i know another neurosurgeon who went into that field because he had neurosurgery um and so i'm just i'm 
pretty certain about it. Um, and there are two programs that do have like pre matching into neurosurgery, wow. um, that I found it took some digging around because they're pretty new. Um, but I don't know, do you know anything about those programs or do you know how I could find more information about them? Because I've have found very little, I know that they're there and there's information on the website about them, but there's yeah. just very little. Yeah, I don't know anything specific about those programs. I did have a conversation with uh, Dr. Rafael Rivera at NYU. He's the, the director of admissions there. Mm -hmm. We had a conversation about NYU's move to three-year medical school with predetermined mm -hmm. residency after uh, for, for several different specialties. And so we talked all about like, what does that look like? And what if you change your mind and, and so on and so forth. So I would go back and listen to that interview. And I, I don't know which one it is off the top of my head. Um, but it's, okay. it's, uh, it should be a good interview for you to listen to, to just hear the questions that I ask. And those are questions that you should oh, think about. Yeah to take to these programs mm -hmm. potentially to say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in this program. Wh when mm -hmm. am I applying to it? What happens if I change my mind? What happens if this, what happens if that? Uh, because the okay. what you don't wanna get yourself into is, is some sort of contractual obligation that if you change yeah. your mind, you can't get out of or whatever else, right? You, you wanna protect yourself through this journey. Okay, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Do you know, I guess from your conversation with him or just your experience in the field, what um, would make me a good, I guess, candidate for a program like that? I'm currently, I just got involved in neuroscience research. Um, I'm a CNA and um, I'll be working in the like stroke unit of the hospital um, that I'm working in. And so I'm definitely around like neurologic centered things as much as I can be. Do you know anything else I could do to kind of make myself a better candidate for that? Yeah. For, for any specialty interest in the field is first and foremost, right? Mm -hmm. We, we talk about medical school, applying to medical school. We talk about the interest mm -hmm. in medicine generically. And yes. then when you apply to residency, it's going to be the interest in that specialty. Have you done any research in that specialty? Shadowed physicians in that specialty, et cetera, et cetera. So I would, if, if you're interested in neurosurgery, shadow as many neurosurgeons as possible, get involved in neurosurgery research, uh, which is just an easy question. If you're in and around neurosurgery now, you you have a potential mentor who's a neurosurgeon say like, hey, is there is there any research that I can help with? And, and sometimes it's just boring data collection, but you're in there starting to understand and learn and, and be a part of it. All of that stuff is is good for showing the residency programs, like this isn't just a kind of off the cuff application. I've been in this world for a long time. This mm -hmm. is what I'm interested in. On top of neurosurgery is one of the most competitive specialties stats wise. So you just gotta be a top notch <laughs> student as well. Yes, definitely. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that's about it. Okay. Um, I was trying to find, uh, if you saw me looking down a minute ago, I was trying to look on um, Instagram. There, There's a medical student from Texas. Uh, she's now a, a PM&R resident who had multiple uh, brain surgeries while she was in medical school. I don't know if you follow her on on Instagram. I, can't, I do not. I can't remember her name. I thought it's Cindy okay. or Cynthia. Okay. Um, but I, I believe she had a Chiari malformation and had surgery on that and then had some complications. And so oh, okay. she's mm -hmm. got a phenomenal story. Oh, okay. uh, so go, go follow her on, yeah. on Instagram. Okay. I follow a girl who I know has a brain tumor and she's in med school. So that's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, it's, it's amazing, right? It, it, that goes back to what I was saying earlier, right? We are human beings. We go through this process. We are allowed to have our own kind of stuff. And so there, there's obviously... Um, risk that medical schools are taking on when when accepting students, knowing that some of them are going to be like a normal population and get cancer and get whatever, and and that that's always part of the equation. Okay, okay, that definitely helps. Good. Well, hopefully, this was helpful for you. Give you a little confidence. Keep pushing yeah. forward. Uh, thanks yes, for coming on and, and asking some great questions and congratulations on your recovery so far and, and knock on wood, the Gamma Knife uh, completely <laughs> obliterates that AVM and, and we don't have to worry about it ever again. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.